Hey, what's your origin story? All superheroes and villains, they have them, you know, the defining moment that really shapes who they are. Well, we as God's people, we actually have a shared origin story. Unfortunately, most of Christianity for the last 1500 years has relied on the wrong origin story. We started the story in Genesis 2. You know the moment Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden with a certain bite of a certain forbidden fruit that led to what's called the doctrine of original sin, a theology that says this moment changed human nature and that now our starting place, our default setting is sin. But original sin is not where we begin. Because the actual story of God begins in Genesis 1, with God creating all things, calling each created thing good, and then on top of that, offering three specific blessings. This is our origin story. It doesn't deny the curse and the sin that follows, but we begin in blessing. Our origin story of blessing, which shapes who we are, and it is time for us to reclaim this. Especially now when the effects of the last two years of a global pandemic have left us so lost and disoriented. While conflict and war rages in Ukraine, while we face the current racial reckoning, and while we each weather our own loss and fear and exhaustion. Especially now, as we find ourselves in the season of Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter, which is always a time to stop and enter the desert wilderness journey of Jesus, where his own forming of who he is and what he is to do is an invitation for us to let our own wilderness form us too. And this Lent at Salt House, we let our current wilderness draw us back into our origin story, our original blessing, blessing that is not dependent on who we are or what we do, but it is who we are and it is what we do. To get there, these Sundays in Lent, we'll trace the beginnings of this theme that carries through the entire Bible, the theme of blessing and curse. We'll walk through the three blessings of Genesis 1, then into Genesis 2 to understand the curse. We'll hear a Salthouse story from one of our own. We'll trace blessing and curse through the rest of Genesis, then connect it to Jesus's ministry, leading us to Palm Sunday and Holy Week, where together we walk the great descent into Jesus's death on Good Friday, only to rise again on Easter Sunday. Surprise! Into the blessing of new life on the other side. And so friends, we take a deep breath now, calling to mind and being honest about the other origin stories that we have been told and that we carry. You know the ones I'm talking about, those false stories of needing to perform and perfect and prove ourselves so that through our Lenten journey, God would rewrite our origin story, forming us as God's blessing for our hurting world. So let's relearn it together now. Our original blessing. Well, this is exciting. I've never actually gotten to do the first sermon in the series before, so I really hope I don't screw it up. Uh, but we're starting our conversation today on original blessing by going to the very first page of the Bible. We're going to Genesis 1. Like, you just flip it over to page 1, and that's where we're going to be. And the Bible does something odd. It starts with a poem. And it's a poem about creation. And I imagine that between us here in the room, we probably know most of this poem. So instead of reading it, let's see how much we could retell together. How does it begin? In the beginning. In the beginning. Perfect. And um, we get things in the beginning, like, uh, let's see here. Uh, like we have spirit of God, and we have darkness. Thank you. God was a Sprite fan. People don't know that. <laughs> um, we have darkness. We have chaos. Ooh, sorry, Mom. There we go. And that's how it begins. What does God create first? Light. Light. And then we get kind of this odd refrain. Uh, there was evening. And there was morning.
the first day. It kind of feels like daylight savings time, doesn't it? Like, wasn't it? Like, like it was just evening, now it's morning. What day is it? Um, we'll come back to that in like two hours. <laughs> day two. What happens day two? Close. Lots of good guesses. Uh, no? The sky and the sea. And there was evening, and there was morning, day two. How about day three? Not quite, not quite to the sun. Earth, we got land. Aren't group tests kind of fun? All right, day four. Sun and the moon. We've been waiting for that. And we're told that God separates seasons. Day five? Yes. Birds and fish. And there was evening and morning. And then we have day six. What's missing? People. <laughs> Animals. Dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let you tackle that one next week, Ryan. <laughs> Perfect. And then we get seven days. What's the seventh day? Rest. Rest. And we call it? Sabbath. Sabbath. Two bees in Sabbath, right, Sarah? Sure. Okay. Um, you guys are good. We should tell Rachel. Like, this is like a solid Sunday school A right here. <laughs> and it's interesting, because this is a very strange way to tell an origin story. And yet it's very logical and organized. Like, the days kind of build on each other, right? We've got this pattern of light to sky, sky to land, land to sun and moon. We need, like, seasons on the land. Seasons to birds and fish, birds and fish to animals and humans. But it's actually even like more organized than that. So we've got like these two divisions of three days, like days one through three and then four through six. And you notice how these days set up the next set of days. Like the sun and moon go with light. And birds and fish fill the sky and sea. And then animals and humans get the land. Like, it's almost like there was something behind it. But I think we actually miss how unique this is. Because we never read another origin story, right? Like, this is the creation story that we know. So we miss how other ancient Near East myths captured this. Like, for example, the Babylonians, uh, they were the ones that captured and destroyed Jerusalem. Their creation myth was that creation was born out of a war that their gods had gotten in this epic battle and creation resulted from the destruction. Or the Egyptians, who are like these fearsome foes of the Israelites, they had lots of creation myths that all boiled down to creation being an accident. Um, like there are a few different versions of it, but they basically believed that the gods made everything by mistake and then they kept it going by mistake until eventually Pharaoh came along and was believed to be the god that could like lead creation forward. So this is a very different origin story than other people had. It's not an origin story of war, but of God subduing darkness and chaos. It's not an origin story of mistakes. Like It's a very well thought out story of God systematically crafting each and every aspect of creation. It doesn't feature human gods like Pharaoh, but we get this spirit god that's over and around everything. And you know it's funny, because like the Egyptians also believed that the sun and the moon were gods, and this poem's like, oh no, our guy actually did that. This is a story of God bringing creation into being for a very specific purpose. And that purpose was blessing. All of this was created as the seedbed for blessing. God saw that creation was good, 
and then God added blessing on top of the goodness. It's like the whipped cream on the frappuccino, um, or like getting caramel and fudge with your sundae. There had to be chocolate somewhere. <laughs> Creation was designed as good, and then it was blessed to be something extra. If you remember Pastor Sarah's introduction to original blessing last week, she told us that after the prayers and psalms, the book of Genesis features the word blessing more than any other book in the Bible. And we see that God's blessing is performative speech. There's an action and permission that is granted through, that becomes true through God speaking it. Does anyone actually know what the first blessing in the Bible is? It's here in Genesis 1. So the first blessing comes on day four and then again on day five. So we're going to use a hashtag because everyone knows that's the symbol for blessing. <laughs> The first blessing is be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. It's action and permission that becomes true through God speaking it. It's a blessing, and it's a blessing that often gets interpreted as a command from God to have kids. And that interpretation comes from our good friend, St. Augustine, um, who Pastor Sarah also introduced us to last week. Augustine was a bishop from Algeria and a theologian who shaped a lot of church doctrine. And he gave us this idea of original sin that we're working through this sermon series. And in Augustine's defense, he lived and wrote during the fall of Rome. He's pastoring and praying for people who are seeing their lives devastated and their way of life collapsing. People are coming to Augustine and wondering, where is God? And in Augustine's mind, this blessing of be fruitful and multiply is an easy one. Augustine's trying to say something hopeful when he concludes that like, well, if you get married and your marriage produces kids, well, that's a sign that God's blessing is still with you, so you really don't need to worry about this fall of Rome thing. And I'm sure that was hopeful to some people. But it's a pretty narrow view of what it means to have a fruitful life. I mean, Augustine had no concept of men's and women's fertility health. Augustine lives in a world with no understanding of sexuality or gender. Augustine lives at a time when marriage is a real estate transaction for property. Augustine's trying to speak a good word, but his scope and audience are just limited by what he knows. And Augustine misses a few things in the Genesis story. Like, for one, the blessing isn't just for humans, it's for birds and fish, too. Like, this blessing is first given to all of creation to thrive. Another translation of the Hebrew is, instead of be fruitful and multiply, increase and take up space. Or the Bible Project puts it, if God is the producer, the blessing is the reproducer. God creates goodness, and then the blessing recreates more goodness. And if we look at how Jesus lived, the blessing can't possibly be about children, because Jesus didn't have children. Jesus lived as a houseless, childless, spouseless wanderer. Jesus built a family not through conventional societal norms, but by welcoming, healing, feeding, and teaching. I mean, think about that as a fruitful life. Welcoming, healing, feeding, and teaching. When I think about a fruitful life, I think about the movie Mr. Holland's Opus. Do you remember this movie from 1995? It stars Richard Dreyfuss as um, Glenn Holland, a music teacher who dreams of composing his own symphony. And throughout the movie, things keep getting in his way. Like their budget cuts to the music program, the school board makes him teach driver's ed for a while, his son is born with a hearing impairment, um, which really strains his marriage. But the movie spans his whole career, and he's never able to write his symphony. Yet at his retirement party, all of his former students come back. And one of the clarinet players from his first year of teaching tells him, she says this, you've achieved a success far beyond riches and fame. Look around you. There's not a life in this room that you have not touched. And each of us is a better person because of you. We are your symphony, Mr. Holland. We are your symphony. That's the blessing of a fruit, be fruitful and multiply. And one of the mysteries of God is that when love and grace and passion are present, a new thing happens. We use language like this all the time, right? Like we say, oh, this project is my baby. And one of the ways this happens is to actually make a baby. Like the, there is love and grace and passion present in raising children. And another way this happens is healing the sick and feeding the hungry and teaching and volunteering for a cause, fighting for the rights of trans kids, standing up for marginalized people. There's a Howard Thurman quote that I think captures it well. Thurman says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. 
Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So be fruitful and multiply, blessed by God to come alive and thrive so that all of creation can benefit from who you were created to be. And that's just the first part. Like the humans in the poem are given a second blessing. Any guesses on the second blessing? Subdue and have dominion. Subdue and have dominion. Augustine uses this one to develop his theory of the chain of being. He reads this poem and basically concludes that like the later you are in the creation story, the closer you must be to God. And you know, Augustine sort of misses the fact that like, well, the birds and fish got blessed too. So like there's something more than that going on. But Augustine isn't wrong either. Like he's on to something. Subdue and have dominion. The Hebrew word for subdue is kabosh. Kabosh. Like this word's also made it into English. Like we say, we need to put the kibosh on that. And the word was originally used to describe practices of war and empire building. It meant to bring into bondage, to make subservient, to force, violate, and dominate. So it's not a great word. And it's kind of a weird blessing. But to be fair, we have to remember that the ancient world was a really scary place. Like life expectancy was about 20 years old. If you made it to 30, you were very much at old age. Like, so 14 was about a midlife crisis. <laughs> and not only are there lions and tigers and bears that could kill you, but there's also dysentery. And there aren't antibiotics. So a paper cut is a literal death sentence. So when God blesses humanity to kibosh creation, this could really be a vote of confidence. Like, y'all got this. Go out there, kibosh your way into thriving. But I think we can all see that like, the line between kiboshing that thrives and kiboshing that dominates is very thin. There's a really gray area that this blessing is treading on because there's a difference between subduing creation to make it more livable and kiboshing the world around us. One is the blessing and the other is not. And we see Jesus live this out too. When Jesus demonstrates that he has dominion over creation, there's no bondage or force or violation. Jesus practices this blessing through service, through foot washing, feeding, welcoming children, healing, Jesus shows that having dominion is not about empire building because that doesn't lead to an abundant life. And think about the interplay of these two blessings in our world today. Be fruitful and multiply, subdue and have dominion. The original blessing is opening up something that is radically political. Like this blessing could be tied up to every conversation we ever have. So let's talk about the environment. I mean, if all living creatures are blessed to be fruitful and multiply, to thrive, and humans are blessed to subdue and have dominion through service, how does that change how we approach the world around us? I mean, again, there's a difference between subduing the land to make it more livable versus taking resources while destroying habitats and desolating the earth. Or let's talk economics. I mean, there's a difference between a system that incentivizes creativity and growth versus a system that's controlled and forces people into debt and poverty. Or even international relations. I mean the difference between partnerships and alliances versus invasions that take land and resources. Like, we can just keep going. I mean, this could be about everything. Sexuality, business ethics, race relations, inter-religious dialogues, or mental health. I could really preach like the most political sermon ever if we wanted to right now. But we've only scratched one single poem in the Bible. And isn't it interesting how the two blessings support each other? I mean, be fruitful and multiply is supported by subdue and have dominion. The first blessing is permission to thrive, and then the second blessing makes sure that we service the first blessing to support this thriving in creation. It's really a brilliant system. And there's more, because there's a third blessing. The third blessing comes on the seventh day, when God rests and deems it holy. And it's funny, because on the surface, this blessing has basically been boiled down to go to church, be religious, take Sundays off, and yet there's something very urgent being conveyed here. I've said several times that Genesis 1 is a poem, and we know that different poems have different structures. Like Shakespeare wrote um, sonnets, which have this like A, B couplet rhyming scheme, or a haiku has a certain number of syllables in each line, or think like Dr. Seuss, who just makes up words and rhyming schemes every time you read it. <laughs> well, the ancient world also offers us unique poetry styles, and one of the most popular forms of ancient Near East poetry is called a chiasmic structure. 
So if you think of an hourglass, the message of the poem is embedded in the middle and then restated at the end. Um, so you get the meaning halfway, and then it's reinforced at the last line. So looking at Genesis. The exact middle of the poem is God dividing time into seasons. And then it ends on this note of rest. It's like God is saying life cannot all be one speed. There are seasons in life for everything. This is why church has different seasons, like the season of Lent. God knows that life needs rhythms, and seasons focus us on different things that need our attention. But the end reinforces the point of those seasons. Rest. Rest is the only time that God blesses. In fact, it's the only non-living thing that God blesses. And notice one other thing about this poem. Every day has this refrain of there was evening and there was morning. I told you we'd come back to it. This is a really interesting way to tell time. We use the Greco-Roman way, where we have morning and then evening, but the Hebrew way was evening and then morning. Have you ever noticed that Jewish holidays start at sundown? This pattern of evening to morning was observed by the priestly class of ancient Israel as the pattern of a believer's journey. Your walk with God always leads you from darkness into light. And every day of creation has this refrain of evening and then morning, but not the seventh day. According to the poem, the seventh day is blessed, and the seventh day is ongoing. The blessing of the seventh day is that we can live in this space, resting in God's goodness, resting in God's Sabbath, and reconnecting with God. It's as if the blessings truly were designed for one another, that in order for creation to be fruitful and multiply, it must be subdued and serviced, and in order for that to happen, there must be sacred time for rest and reconnection with God. And we see Jesus do this too. If the Sabbath was all about going to church, Jesus fails. If it was a day off, Jesus fails that too. We know stories of Jesus escaping away from the crowds to pray and connect with God. Remember, Pastor Sarah has talked about this before as one of Jesus' great loves, a love of God uh, and a connection through prayer that sustains Jesus in his work. We know that Jesus did take time to rest and reconnect. But we also know that Jesus gets accused of doing work on the Sabbath. He heals. He casts out demons. He does these things that contradict the Sabbath as rest. But when healing happens, God is always present. And this is so much more than being pious or sleeping in. This holy, blessed Sabbath is God's will for us to have seasons in our life where we rest, reconnect, and heal. So if we pull it together, be fruitful and multiply is not just about reproduction, but about living a life that multiplies the goodness that God created in us. Subdue and have dominion is not just about domination, but about serving the world in ways that help life thrive. And Sabbath is just pure grace. It's a reminder that rest and healing and worship are sacred, and they are necessary to make this blessing possible. And we have to talk about blessings as if they're related to prosperity. We talk about blessings as money or success or health, but our gospel reading that Jim read for us has Jesus telling us that the point is not prosperity, but an abundant life. This line in John 10, 10 connects us to this original blessing when Jesus says, I came that you may have life and life abundantly. Jesus lives in a world of empires, and an empire might tell you that creation is a resource for your taking. But this blessing says, no, abundant life happens when creation thrives. Or an empire might tell you that you can do what you want with creation, where this blessing says, no, abundant life happens when you have the wisdom that you've been given to steward and serve life around you. Or an empire might tell you that you are only as useful as the work that you produce, where this blessing says, no, abundant life happens when you remember that rest is sacred space and necessary for you to heal. The abundant life Jesus is talking about is directly related to this original blessing. And it's funny, because if we go back to this poem, um, to this creation story, we ask it all sorts of questions that it was never meant to answer. Like, we ask it questions of science, like, where are the dinosaurs? Or we ask it questions of history, like, when did this all happen exactly? But this poem is not about science, and it's not about history. It's about you. This is your creation story. 
It's your origin story. God very systematically created the world and called it good. And God blessed that world, and then God created you. And God saw that you were good and blessed you too. God gave this blessing to thrive and serve and rest and heal. This is your creation story and your origin story. It's your original blessing. And can I be honest with you for just a second? I had such a hard time writing this sermon. And I really hope I didn't screw it up. Because I have struggled all week long to believe that this blessing is true. Like God blesses me to thrive or to serve or to rest. I have so internalized the opposite message. Like I have internalized that there is one way to be fruitful and I'm worried I'm not good enough. And I've so internalized that in order to have dominion, like to kibosh, I have to be assertive and impressive. And I'm 28 years old. Like the idea that I have anything to offer or serve in creation just doesn't feel possible. And then this idea that I need rest to reconnect with God. <laughs> I'm in seminary. I have a 4-0 to maintain. <laughs> like, I don't have time for that rest thing. And it pops in my head all week long. Like when I FaceTime with my mom, I hang up and I'm like, do I call her enough? Am I, could I be a better son in some way? Or my boyfriend goes home, I'm like, did I tell the right jokes? Do I listen enough? Am I doing this boyfriend thing right? I mean, later tonight, I'm gonna be sitting around going, hmm, that was a long sermon. <laughs> like, did I say the right things? Were they the right things? I really wanna diagram the poem right, and I really don't wanna screw it up. And I don't say this all for your sympathy, I say it because I literally wrote nine drafts of this sermon, trying to convince myself that I'm not being hypocritical for saying that we're blessed. But that's not the point. What I discovered in writing this sermon is that I need this sermon. I need a conversation about blessings. Because the point of this blessing is that we are blessed to thrive and to live abundant lives. And anxiety isn't thriving. Perfection isn't thriving. Approval from our family and friends isn't thriving. It isn't fruitful. It isn't multiplying. And it isn't the good kind of kiboshing. It serves no good in creation, and it doesn't help us to rest or heal. And God sees that we are good and blesses us on top of that. And I believe this is true. I just have a hard time living into it because life doesn't always feel good, which is what Pastor Ryan's gonna talk about next week. Because in the beginning, God saw that it was good, but we know now that not everything is. Something is wrong. This original blessing is not always reality, and sometimes it may feel like a fairy tale. So next week, we're gonna look at another creation story in the Bible and what happens to this original blessing when we don't believe in it or live up to it. But that's next week. So this week, I invite you to believe that this is true. I invite you to believe that God sees you as good. I invite you to experience your original blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. Thrive in this space and this moment that God has put you in doing the thing that makes you come alive and reveals who you were created to be. Kabosh, subdue, and practice dominion. Do this by serving others who need help to thrive. And then rest and experience holiness. Reconnect with your God and with your own journey from evening into morning. Because friends, you were blessed from the beginning and no anxiety, no perfection, no self-doubt or darkness, nothing can take that away from you. You can't screw it up. Amen? Amen. Amen.